Welcome to Open Mind UFO Radio. I am your host, Alejandro Rojas, and I have with me my news buddy, um, Martin um, Fancy Guy Willis. Fancy guy. Mm-hmm. I'm a fancy guy? Well, you know why I'm saying this? Oh, maybe. Because you were just at this. You sent me this video of where you were at, and I don't know if you, you probably can't disclose whose home it was, but um, just this amazing, like, you know, because you do antiques and stuff, but this, it looked like a museum or it looked like a, a palace with all of this it, art and stuff. Yes, it's this, uh, yes, it's someone involved in television, I will tell, their family has been for a long time, but oh yeah, it's just a sweet um, six floor townhouse in, on Commonwealth Ave in Boston. Beautiful, beautiful hmm. stuff. It was really a fun, a lot of fun. I love my job. I love that part of my life. Yeah, that is fun. That's really interesting stuff you get to do. Mm-hmm. So Lucky guy. That's why you're fancy. <laughs> you're going to look at all that fancy stuff. But we also do UFOs, of course. But uh, real quick, oh, yeah. before we get into yeah. the news, let's talk about my guest for today, who is Chase Kletsky. So ah. she is a good old, good old buddy, uh, director of investigations for the Mutual UFO Network, the largest UFO investigation organization in the country. And uh, possibly the world. And so she's got a big responsibility because many people, if you're, you know, anybody really could take a test. You know, you get this manual, you you study it, you take a test, and you can become uh, a field investigator for the Mutual UFO Network. I did that for several years, actually. Oh, and guess who um, graded my test? Who? Kathleen Martin. She really? used to run wow. that portion of... Uh, the, for the MUFON. Um, now she's in charge of their abduction research, but she's been with MUFON for a long time. So Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, isn't that cool? So, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so Chase is in charge of all of those people across the country, of which there are, um, I'd imagine, hundreds. And uh, so she is on top of all these investigations. But here's what's really exciting. She has recently decided to kind of engage Washington, D.C., and it turns out she's moving out there, or I think she's already moved out she's there. She's already there, yeah. Mm-hmm. So she mm-hmm. got this card to be a lobbyist. Of course, we're going to talk about this, but this is what's exciting, is that she's actually going to be talking to a subcommittee of Congress, and I guess it has to do with, um, uh, you know, potential threats in airspace type of of. of uh, subcommittee, and she's going to be allowed to do a 10-minute presentation for them. Wow. Isn't that Amazing. cool? Yeah. So we'll talk more about that in that presentation, and she'll share with us, you know, how she made that come about, and uh, we'll also talk about, you know, um, some of the cool stuff MUFON is up to. She's great. I love her. She's just wonderful. And she, she's she's such a good orator, too. Yeah, she is great, you know, and one of the things that we didn't talk about now because we've done it in the past is uh, just to demonstrate, you know, she really follows the the science when she's doing the research. So, for Mm -hmm. instance, she was... Wherever it goes. What's that? I said wherever it goes, she follows it. So, she was taxed with uh, investigating the star child skull, which for decades Mm -hmm. people have been saying, oh my gosh, it's an alien. And she found out it wasn't. But, um, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, she did some good work to discover all of that. And, uh, you know, she's brave enough to say, "Uh, sorry, I know you wanted me to follow up on this, but looks like Mm -hmm. it's not as mysterious as we once thought. But uh, that's one example. Yeah, the way things should be done and the way, unfortunately, um, a lot of things, people really want to hang on to, you know, an idea. I know Lloyd Pye never got to see that. He was you know, working on that for years. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't think that he was ever able to get the full DNA, 
full DNA test like um, she was able to. Yeah, I'm not sure in the difference of the, the investigations, but she, she finally solved it. She's also working with this group, and it's going to be in the links, and some people will, will might wonder why, and I don't know if we even got to this in the interview, but she works with this group called Bohik Ruse Explorer Society, where they're doing uh, different um, investigations on mysteries and things around the world. Really interesting stuff. So that link will also be in the show notes, hmm. whether you're listening to this on uh, whichever way you're listening. Or I guess if you're listening on KGRA, you got to go to openminds.tv and then you'll be able to find that link or on YouTube. Speaking of YouTube, well, you know what? Yeah, it, let me plug something real quick before sure, I yeah, go. Sure, right ahead. So I was recently at the... Uh, as recent as what last weekend, weekend before last, I was in Wyoming for this conference, right? Mm. And it was the Devil's Tower UFO Rendezvous, and I got some really cool videos of some of the speakers and I asked them some questions. And the background's cool because in the background you can actually see Devil's Tower, um, and they're outside and, and they're just really nice. So I've released one of those. I've got another one I'm going to be putting out. But the first one I released is UFO researchers discuss close encounters of the third kind. And of course, they talk about the movie and how important it is. I'm in there too. And uh, so it's a really fun video. And you could see yeah. that on uh, the Open Minds production YouTube site. And then soon, hopefully, by definitely by the end of the week, I'll have the second video out. And that video is going to be more of, you know, kind of the reaction of, of the state of ufology today, especially given this recent revelation that uh, the Pentagon was investigating UFOs. UFOs. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. Heavy That's stuff. Good. Yeah. Yes. All right. But... Without further ado, let us get into some more UFO news with Martin Willis. Fancy. Fancy Willis. guy. Yeah. All right. Um, well, um, you know, there's not a lot going on as far as UFOs that I've seen as far as <coughs> not really a whole lot going on. So I would like to talk today about us being a UFO from Earth to someone else. And that's uh, Japan had two hopping rovers successfully mm. land on an asteroid, uh, Ry- Ryugu. Uh, and I may be pronouncing that wrong, but uh, I did try to figure out how to pronounce it. That's as, as good as I can get now. And I, this this just fascinates me. I know that uh, you know when it comes to landings, um, we had a landing all the way back, uh, the near Sh- Shoemaker back in 2001. Um, and then um, uh, also we were on a comet, which I thought was really fascinating, uh, in, uh, in 2005. And so this uh, landing happened on the 21st of uh, this month, September. And uh, so there's two little tiny hopping robots. And what they do is they basically go down to and land, and then they – it almost looks like a little jackhammer, but it's like this little probe that gets material that's supposed to be sent back. Um, to Earth, and I know they did have the, um, this is called the Hayabasa 2, the Hayabasa, the first one, um, I know that it was, uh, it did successfully send back a little bit of dust. Um, Now this is, uh, the material that it's getting now is going to be sent back, it's going to arrive in late 2020, so it does take quite a while. I mean, this is, I think it's 220 million miles away i I should uh, be able to read that somewhere here it's very very far away um this orbits the sun and it's kind of an odd looking um uh, asteroid almost like a square almost like it looks like a a pill or a tablet or something and it has a couple of pictures that it was taking as it was going down to land very blurry um there's uh, if you go to space.com and other sites you can see some of these images there's one that's really uh a really nice image of the surface of the asteroid i just i just this whole thing just i don't know it really excites me when there's landings um and how they can actually do something like that it's so fascinating how we have that technology to be able to do something that's hurtling through space at a very high speed and how we can actually land something on there um i think it's a a great uh human accomplishment i agree with you this is really really cool um 
Asia, Japan, and China are really kicking it up with their space programs. Um, China especially, in fact, really, I think, uh, I've argued this in, in articles before, and, and I've talked with people about it, how China has really pretty much forced our hand and, and made us go back to the moon so we can beat them because they're headed there next and Russia is following yep. suit. So we've got this new space race to the moon. And mm -hmm. Japan has also kicked it up. And this is a big deal what Japan did because um, it really is. Uh, in the last couple of years, there's been a couple of corporations, a few corporations who have made the argument and supposedly successfully to demonstrate that there is a, a it is economically feasible to begin looking into mining on the moon or on on outer space, not just the moon or Mars, but um, these asteroids. So Amazing. they're gathering new data. And, you know, we may be in this new world like we see in science fiction all the time where it might not be too long before, you know, some company, maybe a Japanese company starts mining one of these asteroids um, because, you know, some of them are said to have a lot of different minerals. And, uh, yeah, so this brings us one step closer. And it, it's mind-blowing to think of, you know, with how difficult it's been in the past with uh, different space programs. For instance, Russia had a few of their probes and, and rovers die on the way to Mars. Yeah, um, failed mission. Yeah, how they were successful in these missions. They were able to get these little guys on the asteroids and... The few pictures, like you said, most of them are blurry. The few pictures that look good where you could tell what's going on there that are high resolution are mind-blowing just to think that this is an actual asteroid out there in space. Mm -hmm. I know. And it just seems to – it seems like the, any material that would come back would be just so fascinating to you know, to uh, actually touch and see you know, in person. I'd, I'd almost want to see something – I mean just – if you think about yeah. the journey, you know, um, you know, maybe someday that won't seem like much, but now something that's 200 million miles away, we could actually have something come back from it. I think that's just totally amazing. Yeah, and you know what, though? It, you know, recently, uh, what, last year, there was this planetary protection officer position that NASA was looking for, and people are like, oh, my gosh, what are they talking about? And um, <laughs> essentially, it was the protocols to make sure that we do not contaminate uh, anything in space and vice versa, because we haven't been very careful of that. Right. And it is kind of scary. I mean, what if... You know, there's some sort of dormant microbe or, or virus on, in this dirt. I hope we're careful and cognizant of that when we do examine stuff. So don't, you know, don't get too close to it, Martin, if you do have the yeah. chance to. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Just like in the movies, you know, I mean, these things come to Earth from alien worlds. Yeah. And take over the world, whether through disease or whatever. Bum, bum, bum. Mm. But yeah, that is really cool news. I have a couple other cool news stories. All right. So this is cool. Um, uh, Chiro Costa, who writes for Syracuse New Times, of course, does a weekly UFO piece. And this is interesting. She did a piece called Diversity in UFO Statistics, The Truth in the Shapes. And she was talking about, you know, um, how the shapes uh, – Essentially, well, how overall sightings that a lot of people say that she only says 7% may be real. And she says, I don't say that, although I think 7% is a good number personally. But mm -hmm. she made this argument that the stranger the shape, the more likely it is a real phenomena. And, of course, having spent time with David Marler this last week uh, for... He was also one of the speakers, and he talked about triangular UFOs. That's an example she uses, that with triangular UFOs, if someone is seeing a triangular craft, clear triangular, triangular craft, it is less likely that they are mistaking it for something mundane than if they're seeing points of light or just a point of light. And I think that's a very good argument. And mm -hmm. so she broke out. You know, what about these sightings that are all these different weird shapes where someone clearly sees a shape that is not normal for an aircraft? Hmm. I think it's an interesting argument. And is this a, a, a graphic, something you can see graphically? Uh, or is she just mentioning shapes? 
No, she's running the numbers because that's her thing, right? Is oh, using oh, all the it. numbers for MUFON. So she's yep. showing you all the different sightings that have these different shapes that are less. Um, she's making the argument that are less likely to be mistaken for something normal. Now, isn't it? I've had a number of people contact me. I'm sure they have probably uh, you as well. Where people say, "Well, how come you know we saw, saw the discs?" You know, like the flying saucers at one point, and then you know this shape at another point, and and the triangles, and you know why are they why are they changing? I think it's a valid question. I don't, of course, like everything else when it comes to UFOs, I really don't have any type of answer <laughs> for that. But it does seem. Now I know um, when uh, Marsh was writing for Open Minds, he was focusing on. Triangles, and it just seemed like there was a lot of triangle sightings. But um, when you look at what sh- the work she's doing, what is the besides lights in the sky? What is the most common, uh, st- you know, structure or shape that people are seeing? It is triangles, really. Um, you could, if you look at the numbers, and here's what I feel, especially if you look. I think a lot of those could be grouped together. When someone says it's a, a point of light or a small circle, or, you know, there's other things that they use there that could all, I think, be similar. Grouped together is possibly the same thing. So if you Mm -hmm. take those groups and take those out of the equation, uh, or you group those together, what would be next would be triangular shaped. And Roger wrote about those, and we've talked about it too, and of course we've talked about it with many different guests on the show, um, is that the triangle incident seemed to be the most blatant, where they're almost like, look at me, look at me, you know? Right. Um, and that's what's interesting about the triangle shapes. And that goes way back, too. It's not like right. something just recently. Right. I mean, Marler makes the argument that there he's found cases from the 1800s, late 1800s, but he also shows news clippings from the 1950s, 1920s even, of similar accounts. Um, and these accounts, what are shocking, uh, are very similar. In fact, he has an image from something like the 20s, and you take that image up against what they were saying they were seeing in Belgium in the 90s, which is the same of what people say all over the place. And they're strikingly similar. Amazing. It is a really cool topic. Really weird. So, and and a lot of and a lot of similarities people say about the triangles. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean that uh, a lot of times they're massive. Uh, you know, I mean when I first heard someone, you know, talk about uh, triangle when I first started the show, uh, uh, amateur astronomer Andy, uh, real nice guy in England, he was telling me he was carrying his. Uh, his telescope home from a night of uh, of observing, and uh, he said, all of a sudden, without any noise, he said this massive triangle glided right over him <clears throat> with lights, and uh, he said, that's when I believed in UFOs. Who was that? <laughs> it was Andy. Unfortunately, he passed away. Oh he, no! A young guy too. He was on my show. Um, he was an amateur mm. astronomer. Oh uh, wow! Super nice guy. Um, but, uh, well, that's really sad. You know, he never even never thought of uh, UFOs and all of a sudden this thing just glided right over him on his way home. Wow. Amazing. That's so cool. Yeah. yeah. Uh, An- Andy Fleming was his name. Hmm. Great guy. Couple other yeah. stories. So, uh, in the big media, we have a story that is not so much different than others. The, and this is in news a week. It's, it was not that great of a story, but, um, Interesting. It was called Do Aliens Exist? Blink-182 co-founder and ex-Pentagon official are determined to prove we're not alone. And this story, it seems, was inspired by Elizondo's uh, presentation at MUFON. Uh, and it seems like the writer was there. The writer makes an argument. Why are you talking to this group of UFO weirdos, kind of? Which is an interesting thing for him to bring up and Elizondo kind of said well these people have been looking into this for a long time and uh, you know and they want to hear they're listening so I came to talk to them Hmm. so uh, but yeah it was interesting it was kind of like Newsweek struggling with this topic and kind of struggling to take it 
seriously in in some ways they did in some ways they didn't but um there was a little bit of criticism here and there and they didn't have their facts completely right uh on a few things actually but uh mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's an interesting article. Of course, we've had the Washington Post, which I think was a better article, not just because they quoted Open Minds, but um, they wrote one called UFOs are are now a credible topic, thanks to, you know, Bleak 182 co-founder or whatever. Um, but uh, that's a good article. Um, so, and then the History Channel. So the History Channel is coming up with this television right, show on Blue Book. So they have mm-hmm. another new article out on a great case because they're writing articles on these good cases that were in Blue Book. And this one yeah. is called When Dozens of Korean War GIs Claimed a UFO Made Them Sick. That's right. I read that. Yeah. Uh-huh. And, yeah, interesting. Uh, so do you remember the gist of the story? I Yeah, but, you know, I don't remember ever hearing about this. It was back in 1951, um, a year or two a year into the Korean War. And uh, do you want me to read through a little bit of it? Sure. Yeah. So so this was back in, like I say, 1951, and uh, about 60 miles north of Seoul. Um, They were preparing to bombard a nearby village with artillery. All of a sudden, the soldiers saw a strange sight up in the hills, like a jack-o'-lantern come wafting down across the mountain. And what happened after the pulsing attacking light, uh, quote, unquote, um, the lingering, de- it started the lingering debilitating symptoms that would mystify many for decades to come. Um, had you ever heard of this prior to this story? No, but you know what? That was something that we were doing in the magazine for a while, and we've got a lot of those. What I was doing, I, I had a section called um, Blue Book Unknowns, and I was going into the Blue Book Files pulling out the unknowns, especially the good cases, and writing about them. Wow. And there are many really good cases in there we never hear about. Um, And so, yeah, you could go to our website, and I think we even have a drop-down for Blue Book, or you could, you know, Google Blue Book, and you'll find all of those uh, articles I wrote, of course. But there's more I could write. So there are still a lot of great cases. So I would recommend you've got to go download, go look up Blue Book Unknowns, because you have to get a list of which ones were unknown. So you have to do actually your own research. And then once you have this list of unknowns, you need to go to Fold, uh, I think it's Fold 5, the site that has all the Blue Book um, files, and then you need to search in those, which isn't too hard. They have them separated by date and location, and you can go and then read those accounts. And so many of them are really good. That's a really great place, by the way, to write articles, find some stuff for some good articles. Wow, great idea. Um, well, this this was really strange because... Uh, um, he felt like when they were attacked that there was a ray that was emitted in pulses and waves that you could visually visually see uh, when it was aiming directly at you, um, almost yeah. like a searchlight. And he remembers a tingling sensation sweeping over his body. And, uh, you know, there was speculation at the time that it might have been an experimental Soviet weapon. Hmm. You know, but 1953, yeah, yeah, it's bizarre. I don't know. All right. The last thing I want to talk about here is really important finding. So anyway, do you remember John Callahan? Oh yeah, the the uh, from the Alaska. Right, this Alaska um, UFO sighting, and we don't have time mm-hmm. to get into details. J A L. And I need to look into this more, and I'll write a story on it. But the Black Vault, uh, he says he was told for years that there were no files. Uh, that the files were all lost. Well, he just found mm. something like 1,500 files on this case that he posted oh just in the last couple of days. So I've still got to go through those and see what's in there and write something up. But that's another real exciting thing that's happened. But we are out of time. We are yep. so fast. It yes. flies, doesn't it? That's right. Well, just thank like you, a Martin. Robot what's asteroid that? hopper. Yes. Just like a robot asteroid hopper. Right. Yeah, that's yes. cute. That's a cute little joke. So, uh, thank you so much, Martin, for joining us. Of course, check out Martin on Podcast UFO. You're welcome, as always. 
Those of you listening on KGRA will hear a commercial break. Those of you listening to the podcast will hear a slight musical interlude. And then we'll be back with our guest, Chase Kletsky. I am very happy to welcome back to the show my good friend, Chase Kletsky. Hello. Hey, Alejandro, I'm so happy to be with you. It's been a while. Even recently when I was thinking about it, I was like, oh my gosh, it's been a while since Chase has been on the show. It's fun. It's always fun to be with you. It real. is fun. In fact, I haven't had you on the show since you've had uh, your title as Director of Investigations. Yes, that's actually kind of new with MUFON, absolutely. Uh-huh. And how long have you been in this role now? Uh, probably... Three months, four months, yeah, mm-hmm. a whole 15 minutes. <laughs> but it's probably been a pretty hectic 15 minutes. It has. Um, there was, I kind of had a mindset walking into the position when it was offered to me. And, um, you know, I'm just different than the last one. And for me, I have um, a laser focus on, you know, being a, a director of the investigators. And what that means is my number one priority is just, just what can I do for them for them to be successful? And that's my bottom line. Mm-hmm. And, you know, speaking of, of why this is such a busy role, I mean, how many investigations would you, uh, do you think might be going on at once? Like even right now, how many investigations are there out there? I can tell you that MUFON right now is between 750 to 1,000 reports a month. Wow. That is yeah. that is a ton of reports. And then some of those, about what percentage take, you know, um, more time, like warrant a, a more deeper, uh, closer look? Well, we use the valet classification of category one, two, and three. And, you know, category one is kind of a quick one. You really wouldn't require a boots on the ground or on-site visit. They're mostly the lights in the sky. Um, category two offers something like maybe trace evidence or, you know, a closer contact. It was within 500 feet. You know, we, we could dig in a little deeper. And then, of course, a cat three is, you know, there's definitely physical or trace evidence, um, and we need to get out there because there's something real going on. And those are the cases that uh, really produce a lot of data. Mm-hmm. So um, about how many of those do you think, Does it, it probably varies uh, how many of those are going on at one time. Um, there are but, about 3% of the, uh-huh. the total is a cat three. It'd be about a 3% average. And, you know, honestly, um, the statistics really haven't changed much. Um, I remember hmm. 10 years ago saying we have to chase 100 to find that one, and that hasn't changed. And and what that means, if you've got 1,000 cases, is that that's 30 cases. Yeah. That's quite a bit, you know, to be going on. Where you know, and, and that's significant to think that right now, you all, MUFON, has 30 cases that, you know, are, are substantial and significant. Absolutely. And, you know, we're coming close. Um, It will be shortly after 2019 that we tick over 100,000 cases in our CMS. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's amazing. And what's really amazing about that, too, is that MUFON was really late to the digital age. I was around during that time. And when I first started investigating, we were still all paper. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. And we were like that for a really long time. I was I joined MUFON back in 1996, and mm-hmm. my first ID, we had to tape our own photo on, and it was um, <laughs> printed off a typewriter and hand-signed by Walt Andros, and I still wow. have that, by the way. And, you know, yeah, we've come a long way, but, you know, I think my favorite thing about MUFON is we're the world's historians and archivists for investigated UFO reports, and... Of course, we work very closely and and have a lot of respect for uh, Bill Puckett and obviously Peter Davenport and the National UFO Reporting Center. You know, all of this matters. Um, And and we are the archivists, you know, the historians. And Mm -hmm. and if you want to look at UFO reports of witnesses, 
But then what did the investigators have to say? The people that looked into it, what did they find? And that's what separates us. Mm -hmm. So I want to mention before we get too far also that uh, the last time uh, we got to hang out was at the International UFO Congress. And to me, you are uh, definitely one of the uh, very prominent researchers, one of the best out there. And but you were behind the desk helping us at the table register and sell products. That was so funny. You didn't even have a talk last year. No, and it's okay. Because first, Congress is the the best of the best. It is the best conference. If you can only do one, this is the one to go to. Um, it never fails. Um, the attention to detail is immaculate. And I... I'm a little selfish because I think that uh, Phoenix MUFON and Arizona MUFON is uh, probably our best, cha- not probably, the best chapter we have. Um, these guys cross, cross T's and dots I's, but it's the friendships I have. Um, you know, the longer I'm in it, the in it, meaning UFO field, the more isolated, you know, we become as you know, we kind of narrow in our work group. Um, who's our peer group? Who are the colleagues that we trust the most and want to work with? And, you know, that's, for me, my first choice is always all of you in Arizona. And because I love it, you know, I don't care if I'm working. I had so much fun behind that desk with Karen and, you know, just getting to see the people come in. I don't have to be up on a stage. And I really don't. Um, I just, I, I love the camaraderie and, and just being there. You even got to work with our family. Karen had a daughter working there. I had yeah. both of my sisters and oh my, my stepdad and, came. Yes. And I love your sisters. And, um, of course, Karen's daughter is a doll. Oh, my gosh. And we all really got along very well and worked well together. So, um, yeah, I am plan on helping out this year if I can because um, – yeah, I, I had a couple people saying, Chase, what are you doing behind the counter? And I said, having the best time like I always do when and I'm I, at Congress. <laughs> I wanted to bring that up just because I, I think your attitude is so great when it comes to, you know, um, uh, placing ourselves in the, in the right sense, I think. Um, making sure that we're, you know, we're all humble and, and helping each other out when it comes to um, trying to get good information out, you know. Yeah. And you guys have always been good to me, uh, you know, um, offering me interviews, you know, early on. And yeah, we we just really take care of each other. And um, we hear so so much negativity sometimes and from the UFO field. And and most of it's true. Um, A lot of a lot of our problems are self-inflicted. But there are groups of us that just struggle to stay out of the drama and really um, protect those that really are our tribe. I mean, we work well together. We've been friends for a long time um, and we have each other's back. So let's get into the meaty stuff, uh, yeah. which is great because you're, you've are you got a, a just an immense amount of it because what I call meaty is real investigation, you know, real uh, uh, progress in this field. And one of the things that you're doing when it comes to progress, which is so exciting, is that you are actually going to do a presentation. Yeah. I, you know, one of the things I did a few, couple of years ago was get a lobbyist ID because I just felt that, you know, what Stephen Bassett's work was doing with, you know, um, the Citizens Hearing for Disclosure, we all watched on Monday uh, those former senators and congressmen being very polite and professional. By Wednesday, they're standing up and pointing out, we need to open those files. So mm. what I, I really gleaned from that and learned was when when information is presented professionally and scientifically, these guys get it. Mm-hmm. Um, they understand it like anyone else. And they don't know. They had no idea any of this. And so the realization that, you know, our law ma- the lawmakers in, in office today have no idea. I kind of thought, well, how do we do that? Well, we've petitioned, we've picketed, and we've held two very important citizens' hearings. What if we just start knocking on the doors? And then I find out we're moving to D.C., which is ironic. But, <laughs> yeah, it was just crazy. And 
So I live here now, and that's what I've, I've done is the first thing I had to do was figure out how D.C. works because it's completely different than any social arena. I mean, any civilization on Earth. D.C. is different. <laughs> and uh, they call it the swamp, and um, I call it a jungle. But because mm-hmm. you do it, you have to navigate through it and, you know, everybody wants to eat you. Right. So <laughs> plants, animals, people, <laughs> D.C. <laughs> so, you know, when you first get here, you think, oh, Office of Science and Technology, that's who I should talk to. And then you find out not even close. They can't help you. So who do we talk to? How do we get in? So the first six months here, that's what I did. Figured out who's who, how this works, play in the game. Um, and, and you have to fit yourself into the system. So what I've done is really work this. Buffon has a great case that we're actually working with um, in close partnership. Um, in fact, it's an alliance with NICAP, Fran Ridge, and his um, scientific group, um, and also Peter Davenport and Bill Puckett. So, you know, we've got this great package of evidence and today's type of a threat and i have been promised 10 minutes and i'll take it that's amazing to get 10 minutes with a threat assessment subcommittee from intelligence um this is exactly who can start the process so i have 10 minutes to convince them to give me 30 minutes or an hour and i'm pretty sure i could do this and i could tell everybody out there that you don't need a lobbyist ID. You don't need to be a rock star. Um, you don't need to be part of you know some big scientific group like To The Stars Academy, which is awesome. But every one of us can get in that door. This is our White House. If, if you're a citizen and you're a taxpayer and you voted, walk in, make your phone calls. That's all it takes is working those phones to get in. And um, they do do background checks. So if you can pass that, you can get in. You do not have to be special or, you know, I'm special secret agent with a backdoor code. It's not like that. Every one of us can do this. And they have never asked me to show my ID. Not once. Not that lobbyist ID. That didn't get me in. What got me in was working the phones. That's interesting and exciting. And, you know, um, we've learned, at least if you've been reading, especially some of the articles that Luis uh, Elizondo has written lately, he's kind of outlined why, you know, the uh, the group that you're speaking to um, is the right group to talk to, that they're the ones who are paying the most attention because, uh, as we all know, it makes sense if we've got these incursions in our airspace of these unknown aircraft, that needs to be a concern. Yeah, and we have to be careful how we present to them because they don't care about Roswell. They don't care about Rendlesham. They don't, they don't have any concern whatsoever to even waste 30 seconds on any of our past great cases. And the reason is, that happened in the 80s. How does that how does that turn into a threat today? Mm -hmm. That's what they care about. What's going on today. And, you know, this case that we're working on in partnership with the other UFO uh, groups and, you know, really experienced investigators. And you need that experience. Um, We've made all the mistakes, you know, 30 years ago, um, 20 years ago. And um, it's a tight core and I'll be able to walk in and actually present something extremely recent um, well documented uh, evidence is applied. Even testimony will be uh, turned into admissible um, testimony. As in, we're, you know, you just do it right. You, you start getting everything um, signed off and, and 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 translated. And yeah, it's just this case is is going to be a door opener. I, I have no doubt. But presenting it well and presenting it with the science, they don't want to hear UFO. They don't want to hear aliens, motherships. They want to hear, um, you know, th- this unknown technology. What do you think this is? You know, it, it, it's most likely not the Russians because this is what our data shows. How could that come in? And, you know, what is this? And we have to follow the money. $22 million. Um, it didn't go beyond me or past me that Senator Rand Paul of Kentucky had a meltdown over that money. Ooh, that might be an in. See, this is how it works, right? Mm -hmm. So I see him have a fit. 
So you call his office and say, yeah, $22 million. How come you guys didn't know that? Shouldn't you approve that? Well, if ATIP and that program is still around, well, how's it funded now? How much money is going into that? And when you find out, can you let me know? You're working on their interest. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so something like that, absolutely. That's how you play it um, in D.C. And it's a chess match. And we're finally... Um, we're finally getting some checks on that board. Mm -hmm. And the $22 million, just for people who, who may not be familiar, of course, this is the money uh, that was given to, essentially, they outsourced Bigelow, but uh, that was the money that uh, Senator Harry Reid and others had um, been able to acquire for this UFO and paranormal investigation, as we've been talking about with uh, some of our recent interviews. And, uh, and so, right now, once it came out that this was done, people like Rand Paul want to know what the heck we're spending $22 million on UFOs. So it's a perfect in for someone like you who has data about ongoing cases um, that they can look into. I mean, how many cases are you all getting a month? Um, 750 to a thousand. I mean, you know, still, um, but personally, when we're looking back on, um, me making these calls and doing this, if every person out there that's listening would call their Congress and Senator that's up here in D.C. and just say, hey, what's up with this A-tip? Are they still going? What's the money behind it? You know, if that if that language starts reaching our lawmakers and we start bombarding them with calls, um, it becomes more of a an issue for them to find out for their constituency. Mm -hmm. And I, I think especially, too, if, if we we those of us who feel positively about the government doing UFO uh, investigations, you know, sharing your point of view. Really, it'd be nice if they did this openly. Uh, we know France and Chile both investigate UFOs, very open, transparent reporting stuff, Fairly. like through their government. Although France's uh, annual reports are, are classified when they put their, their reports in. Yeah, but they do openly do this. So yeah. it's it's a step right. closer. And, you know, I think this is something that, you know, once they acknowledge this program still going on, you know, it's baby steps. It's how mm -hmm. it's done in D.C. I don't believe for a second that we can all stand on those, you know, the Capitol steps and scream disclosure and we're ever going to get it. There is no win for D.C. Nobody wins in D.C. by saying, OK, let's just open the files. It's so it's never going to happen. It's just not how it works. We have to crack it and, you know, um, take take kind of that slow process. And it's one step ahead each time. And as much as um, people are very divisive over uh, Trump, he's a disruptor. And if he feels like it could just piss off so many people on that hill, he just may be the president that opens up a whole lot more than we had a chance with anyone else. And I know that people gave uh, like Clinton and Podesta um, a lot of credit and hope and confidence that they could do this. And yet they've never given us a reason to believe that Podesta was in there. Um, Clinton was in power. He did ask questions, but he also signed the most tight, restrictive, top secret um, closeout or classification on all military black ops. So if this is really a disclosure type of couple, um, you know, they certainly didn't have the mind for it. Trump doesn't come from DC. So, you know, would Hillary and, or, you know, a, a branded politician, professional politician, they're not going to do this. It pisses off too many people. They owe lobbyists. There, there's a whole career of reasons why they couldn't do it. Someone like Trump, I don't know. He doesn't care if he pisses people off. So, you know. You've got a good point. However, and maybe you know, I have not found any uh, reference from uh, the president about UFOs at all anywhere. No, not at all. And, you know, he would absolutely be the one that knows absolutely nothing. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, you know that I don't believe that the presidents are briefed on this topic. Um, why would they? They're temporary employees and right. they write books and run their mouth after, um, especially these <laughs> days. 
there are no rules anymore. There used to be rules, and there just aren't. And when I say, you know, DC's a jungle, it's politically very difficult to stay out of somebody's pile of something. So um, I just stay focused with, you know, the, the UFO information, but, um, you know, really grateful that, you know, I'm pushing forward. And I, I'm telling you, I can't express enough that the power of the people, you know, the, you know, it, it's, it's like the saying, you know, hear the people rule. And, you know, we have to take that. We have, we have to mm -hmm. um, seize our destiny. And if we want, to be a part of it, sometimes it's just a call to, you know, our lawmakers and say, hey, I, I'm interested in this military program and make them give you answers. Um, mm -hmm. We deserve it. And that starts the conversation. So I, I think one of the most important thing I, I want people to get out of this is, you know, it doesn't take a rock star and a vetted, you know, licensed lobbyist um, to do this. It mm -hmm. really doesn't. They have never asked. And if I could get in without being a, a rock star and they've never asked for my lobby ID. Um, truthfully, I'm just a citizen to them. So we can all do this, everyone. And how have they been? Have they Were they pretty nice to you and, and, and positive? Yeah, I, because I, I don't call them and say, hey, I want, you know, I, I want to report UFO stuff and talk. You know, it's, it's our language, which we've all known we need to change. Um, mm -hmm. I think Steve Bassett said it best when he said, you know, that the UFO um, that was foisted upon us. That's exactly the word, um, you know, by media and pop culture. Um, and, and we've let them. And, you know, UAP and, you know, all these other acronyms, I don't even use them because we know what a UFO is. Everybody knows what that is. So, um, unfortunately, that's what we have. But when we speak to um, D.C. or the people in the House and Senate, we have to understand what their priority is. And if it's not what they do, they don't want to hear it. Their plates are so full up here. It's ridiculous. Um, it, it's important to know that this is what these people do. So that's who you need to talk to. And that's why, you know, figuring out a couple systems. There's a few other, like Rand Paul with the money, definitely hit, you know, some of these subcommittees and who sits on them. And it's easy to find out it's a Google search. I mean, yeah. Yeah, this stuff is not secret. This is the transparency, and we need to seize our own destiny um, as ufologists um, that have been doing it for a while. Mm -hmm. That's pretty exciting. What do you hope as a result? I mean, what would be like a the the best result for um, your the ten minutes that you have? That I get uh, the half hour and an hour, and then I can bring in and invite people like you mm. and Jan and, you know, a few of the top people, Richard Dolan probably be, you know, uh, somebody I'd want to come here as well. But we all go together next time and we present um, the threat, the perceived threat of our airspace to civilian and, you know, military and basically just make the case that we like this idea of a tip and the government um, paying attention. Um, but how do we get more transparency? Um, mm -hmm. We we're not looking for our, our secret R and D stuff. We understand national security, um, but you know, it's time, you know, it's, it's time that whole Condon report that said people would freak out and can't handle um, that's so old news and no one's even buying that anymore. Um, like I said, France and Chile openly investigate UFO reports and, you, you know, the things that happen in their skies. No mass suicide. Churches aren't closing. <laughs> people aren't jumping off bridges. Um, you know, so it's time. It's, it's, it's time to say, hey, we got this going on and we're on it, guys. We're all in it. But when they open it up to Alejandro, and this is what I – then – other people can weigh in. You know, we have our scientific community that can come in. And the ingenuity of the human race, when we're all brought in and allowed part of that process, just the invention alone gets us to the moon, will cure cancer, will give us free energy. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that um, we need to push on our own. But if we're not holding the only people that can change things for us accountable, then, you know, we're kind of spinning wheels. Mm -hmm. I can, I can investigate all the cases out here for the next 10 years 
and and every one every one of them is admissible and it's an unknown 100% a UFO sighting doesn't mean anything if we can't get DC to help us out and change some stuff for us Mm -hmm. open up some files make it more transparent sorry I gotta cut you off but we'll talk more in just a second after this break for those of you listening on KGRA you're gonna hear a uh, commercial break for those of you listening to the podcast you'll hear a short musical interlude and we will be right back with Chase Kletsky Welcome back to Open Mind UFO Radio. This is Alejandro Rojas, your host, and I'm here with MUFON's Director of Investigations, Chase Kletsky, who is also going to be doing a presentation um, for a threat assessment subcommittee um, for Congress, which is very exciting, and we're just talking about that. Um, One of the terms that you use which is important, I think, and is also uh, something that you wrote a book about, admissible. I wonder if you could explain what that term means to you. Sure. Um, to me, admissible um, is our is our benchmark in any kind of investigation. I've always said if, if we're going to be investigators, we need to own that title and we need to take it seriously and and be earnest in our skill sets. And if we're going to investigate, Well, don't reinvent the wheel. We know what already works. So we're going to follow the same um, National Institute of Justice policies and the same type of processes and methods, you know, that any law enforcement um, agency would use. And we have to meet that admissibility. We have tens of thousands of my uncle's neighbor's dad worked at Area 51 and he said, And we have tons of lights in the sky. What we need is evidence. And what we need are prudent um, investigations that even know how to, you know, turn testimony into proper evidentiary entries. And, you know, this is where we're going with this now because we can. Um, Even forensic tools are available to us. And some of these steps are now, um, you know, I, I used to say or I'd like to say is our days of sniffing dirt are over you know we ha- <laughs> you know we have labs that are available um you know we just can't play around we are so close um we have come so far and we have to change and evolve with the technology and the things that are, are with us and the biggest reason is because the witnesses that have seen something that is not supposed to exist they have no one else no one that they can call that will give them a proper investigation to help them figure out what the heck just happened. So I take that personally. Um, When you're the only game in town, we can't blow it. They're counting on us. And, and so is the field. We, we can solve some of these questions by proper investigation, scientific method, and putting our data together and actually doing something with it. Mm -hmm. And you know, what's great is, you don't hear a lot of you. You may hear a lot about scientific investigation. And in the past, we've heard from former law enforcement who get involved with this field in using protocols that law enforcement uses. But I haven't heard in the past, uh, you know, someone um, making sure that they're adhering to both of these sets of protocols like you've been doing, which is important as a director of investigation for for MUFON. And I get really excited about that. I think that's great. And it's great that you've educated yourself on that. And, and you've become, you know, an expert on, on making sure you adhere to those protocols. It is important that, you know, we, we do it right. And um, I'm, I'm fortunate enough that, you know, I could take a course and, and had the time to do that. So, you know, to pass this on and, and you know, um, kind of throw a gauntlet down and move on and raise the bar a little. Our investigators are ready. I mean, they love this and um, they, they want to do the best they can and, and do it faster, do it better, do more. And I'm excited about that. And all the scientific method means is that, you know, we're not ruining our evidence. Um, We're properly um, filling all of this out so that we can answer questions of it not being contaminated or, 
you know, just, hey, what was it doing in the trunk of your car? Well, you could have done anything with that. And so these are mm-hmm. some of the rules that we know you, you know, that you have to follow. And we have to be able to meet that scientific and public scrutiny. And everything we do is about that and doing right by the witness mm-hmm. and getting the truth. A lot of times this scientific method proves it absolutely was a Chinese lantern. And that is such a good thing because we want the truth. We're not looking for a UFO. Right. We're looking for the truth. Mm-hmm, exactly. So, yeah, with this uh, To the Stars Academy, which has, you know, Lou Elizondo, who formerly ran ATIP, the, the Pentagon UFO Project. And then we have a lot of these other government insiders. Um, you know, it, it's almost because it's got so much uh, former government, it's almost a quasi-government organization. Um how do you feel about this this kind of these these new kids in town? I am blown away excited. And the biggest reason is because we as UFO field, you you know, ufologists have been trying to break into a scientific um, government um, insiders all of it. We've been trying to get into what does the CIA know? What does the FBI know? Uh, how about these labs that have contracts with the Department of Defense that are also under top secret security clearances because they're under contract? Uh, Bigelow, um, you know, Pudoff, all Chris Mellon, you know, all these guys with these clearances and they're coming out. This is a game changer. And that's how I saw it. I saw it as, oh my gosh, we have now the opportunity to reach out and work with these people, n- unprecedented, and I did not see that coming. Yeah, none of us did, which is shocking. You know, none of us saw this coming. And even I, um, when Tom DeLong kept saying, oh, it's coming, something cool is coming, I'm like, yeah, right, Tom, I know, we'll right? I see, too. Um, because who could have imagined? And if somebody would have told me that this is what it's gonna, he's going to do, I'd be like, yeah, right, how's he going to do that? But he did, and it did happen, and and it is so extremely exciting. First of all, major media is talking about how UFOs is now a credible issue. Um, it has almost, you know, had this kind of polarizing effect in this field a bit, but um, at least for those of us who are, are excited about, um, you know, uh, the, the credible pursuit of answers in this field, uh, as you just said, it gives us unprecedented access um, and we've been able to discover more um, than ever before. Yeah, and uh, you know, I love that. I love Lou Elizondo. Um, Lou is every every bit of that honorable military man um, right. who has a distinctive a distinctive and merited uh, career that is highly respected. Um, the things that he has done to protect us. In the intelligence world, we'll never know um, the threats, the harms, the right. you know, uh, and you know these guys watch our back, so we don't have to. I mean, they watch our back when you know we're burning flags. It's okay. That's why they do it. Um, and you know, Lou is a patriot, and that is something that I I get a little a little defensive when I hear people you know coming out against him, like you know he's just you know putting out disinformation. Because my first thing is, well, what is it, what is it, what does he say that you is disinformation? Because they're not talking to us, they're not talking to the public. Um, so that's one thing. But my other thing is, be very careful when you go after the credibility. The UFO field's been doing this for a long time. They don't like you; they're going to shred you. And <laughs> be very, very careful going after this highly decorated, extremely honorable veteran. Be very careful. And not only that, you know, I I wrote this lately, is that if you want, if you have criticisms, if you have, don't just bash, organize your thoughts in question. So, for instance, they had a video out. um, Oh, and I'd love your thoughts on this. There's this recent video they put out about how they're going to investigate metals and and all of this stuff. And certainly there are some people who are more science-minded who had some criticisms. But... A lot of people were like, why are they um, blurring the object that's in the uh, video? And, uh, and, but, well, they're not asking that question. They're like, look, they're deceiving and they're lying and they're not doing what they said and they're not sharing information. They're blurring this and, and that shows deception. And 
that's not the right way to approach it. The right way to approach it, which, you know, I want, even though I feel I know what I would answer it, the the right question is, why do you feel it's necessary to hide that uh that material if if you want to share to the public um as a, an investigator and and I think you may feel the same way it's obvious because that is standard protocol in this field even in MUFON you don't share details of your investigation before the investigation's completed absolutely and um I would assume and I have not asked I assumed when I saw that that they blurred it only for the promo and that you know they are, will be talking mm. you know in the show but um you know, I'm all about it. Let them, you know, do this and and, and get some answers. Uh, you know, I just hope that we're going to learn some new stuff and, and, you know, they they get in there. I do worry a little, um, Alejandro, about um, it isn't as easy as it looks on TV, you know, to go out there and, and collect <laughs> evidence and to remember every single detail of that method um, that the National Institute of Justice puts out, and we cannot take a shortcut or miss one. And I have a feeling, you know, like you said, they, they see just something blurred out. And instead of just assuming, knowing as researchers and investigators, we would all probably do that at first. Um, mm-hmm. I just think I think they're going to get hit on, you know, little things that may or may not even be true because of editing or, you know, they. They have yeah. to cut so much be in that process. So I don't know how they're going to do it. Um, I don't, I'm don't. i not sure it's the best move for them to do a TV show on it. Um, I almost think to just do it and put it out as professional video like we do as investigators. Because um, I, I honestly do not believe, and I hope they pull it off. I really do. I do not believe you can have credible scientific method and entertainment. It's just not going to work. Not with this field. Well, and especially because you and I and others um, have been through this before. And, of course, uh, we've been promised up and down that, you know, our our investigations will be treated uh, fairly and the um, information will be treated correctly. And then, you know, you you see the, the presentation and it's awful. Constructive criticism is is not a bad thing, and it is helpful. And I mean, uh, I've told people this, and people have heard me, especially when they they launched this Adam project to investigate metals. I had some concerns, and I voiced those concerns, um, especially around some of the things we're talking about communication. That they've got to be, uh, they should have some protocols about how they're going to communicate to the owners of the metals, the investigators, and the public. And I, I think that's something that they could still work on, but. Um, Constructive criticism is much different than just full out bashing. Yeah. And, you know, we're already seeing that come out. Um, there's a, a kind of a, a, a funny take on that three minute promotion video. And, you know, guys have already figured out when he says, I've got an 18 hour drive to Texas. And then they've already figured out that the metal didn't get there for two days later. You know, I think it's, you know, these type of things that, um, they just don't realize that gets them in trouble. You know what I mean? And yeah. they're new in this game. And at the same time, um, there's a point there. Because what, being new, like Tom DeLong and some of these guys, um, you know, Hal Pudoff and, and Chris Mellon, these are outstanding individuals with, you know, their intellectual pedigree is beyond approach. But they've been in their own little bubble for a while and they don't realize that, you know, this public and the UFO field has been battered and lied to and, um, you know, targeted on many levels. We're just not, we just don't even like one little ounce of, um, suspicion. And that's what you have to work so hard. It's why we work so hard with our cases being admissible. Um, it's why we'll mm-hmm. look for five different peer reviews before we send anything out anymore, um, because everybody's got something to say. And if they can find your your Achilles heel, well, good for them. We have to get better because that's what the public deserves. So I think that's the point where where I was bringing up earlier, which is just we can't have science and entertainment because I think it's the lines quickly get blurred and then the public's confused. Well, are you entertaining us now? And that's the fake entertainment, funny stuff. Or is this, you know, it's. And you and I have ran across this in that 
it, out of groups of people, the most deceptive and manipulative people I've ran across are television <laughs> producers. Oh, yeah. and, and I, yeah, you've ran across this too, where, you know, we're talking the science, the investigation is paramount. That uh, if you're not going to handle this correctly, then I'm not going to be involved. And we're told, oh, yes, of course. Oh, my gosh. We love you. We love your work. Blah, 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 blah. And they feed you all of this stuff. And then they don't follow up with it. One iota. Right. right. And I risk being sued. Um, I was down in Texas with. Um, really? Yes. With uh, Joe Taylor and, and Scotty Roberts um, working on a sizzle reel for a show. And uh, about halfway through it realized very quickly, oh, no, I'm not doing this. And I walked off. Mm -hmm. I absolutely not doing this. Completely pulled myself. And, you know, and they had a right, I guess, to sue me because I signed a non, you know, a, um, a little contract for exclusive for, I think, three months. You know, we're all kind of new at this. I certainly would never sign anything like that this these days. But, um, you know, it's just it's just how it goes. So I'm not afraid to also say, no, I don't think so. Just like with the Rob Lowe show. I can't tell you how many times they asked me to say something about aliens and motherships. And I'm like, no, nope, right. not going to do it. It's not part of my language. Sorry. No. <laughs> and I just think we, we need to, you know, stand firm. And I think if I was going to be sued by walking away, I believe with all my heart, my entire community would back me and come and, and have and, you know, help me out of something like that. So Mm -hmm. And it's being true to yourself and your work, which is great, for instance, that, uh, you know, uh, they're playing on and, and there unfortunately are a lot of people who would say whatever they want them to say just so they could get more camera time. But uh, when your goal is to share legitimate information, you know, um, you got to stand your ground. Yeah. And because it's not just you that can be discredited, you're discrediting every person with ufologists in their title. And, you mm -hmm. know, because you represent um, what the public is seeing um, a ufologist looks like and acts like and talks and speaks well. And, you know, so it, that's just how it is out here. We have to own that. You know, we don't like yeah. to be the example, but when you're on TV saying, you know, I'm a UFO investigator, and then you go out and show how it's done, you better be getting it right. And I, I loved it on that show. Uh, I can't even remember the t name with Rob Lowe. Um, where at the end of the episode, he was even like, you know, I know she doesn't think that it's weird, but I really think it's weird still. And, and it was funny because he seemed silly, to be honest, but it was it was funny how he's like using you as, as more of a skeptic or something. That was, that was yeah, funny. that the UFO investigator was the skeptic on the boat that said, no, this is absolutely a fault thrust. And we proved it yeah. with, you know, HD and side scanning radar, you know, the same technology that found the Titanic. <laughs> it was just amazing. But um, I, I thought it was cute. And um, I didn't have a lot of face time because I did not give them material. And yeah. you know, there was one time um, I heard them all screaming my name. So I go running up there and and Rob's like and all the cameras. I mean, they're completely set up for the shot. And they said, oh, my God, Chase, what's that? And I look up and I'm like, oh, my gosh. I'm like, Rob, it's a drone. It looks just like my phantom. Like that is definitely a drone. Did somebody put a drone up to, to fool him? And everybody was just like, uh, because they really thought I'd be like, oh, my God, look at that. So they were trying to trick oh, you. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, on, on that uh, investigating UFOs, I think it was, I think they tried to trick us, too. Because coincidentally, this Chinese lantern goes up behind the hills. And it was, it was one by itself, not too far away. I totally feel they're trying to trick us. I was there with Ben McGee. And we look at it, and we both go, that's a Chinese lantern. And they were like, oh, yeah. same reaction, like, oh, bummer, <laughs> you know. Exactly. And, you know, it, the good thing is, is, you know, we've been around for a while, so. Um, and these producers may try to trick Elizondo and those guys. I mean, you can't trust these producers, unfortunately. I mean, you have to be very careful with but them. But even if you do it right and they do it uh, or they film it and edit what do they edit out that is really something that would make them credible or not? They don't know right. that. And so that's yeah. my fear about the show with the guys. But, you know, I, I'm going to stand behind them as long as they keep doing what they're doing. Um, 
I, I think it's kind of cool that a rock star has come out publicly. Um, it makes us um, kind of cool and hip to have Lou come out and, and talk about a Pentagon program. It made me feel yeah. so legitimized. Like I jumped up and thought, oh, my God, he just right. he just made me legit. Like every single one of our peers grow, you know, being in the military, you know, and, you know, some of those Navy officer wives would give me that look like, oh, my gosh, are you serious? Kind of kooky, right? I mean, it's <laughs> like, um, remember, I said that the government was still investigating UFOs, and you guys just looked at me like a nutcase. Um, take a left out of your <laughs> husband's office, third door on the right. Ask them what they're doing today. And their heart's in the right place. I mean, you you have met and you just uh, highlighted what everybody who's met Lou has, has said. And you've got experience. Your husband's in the military with, you know, you could tell the people who are true blue patriots who don't think of themselves. They think of the taxpayer. They think of the citizen above everything. And uh, that's the kind of guy he is. And we're out of time, really. But the last thing I wanted to say is what's also exciting is I've always felt there could be a SETI of UFOs, you know, a serious uh, organization that is taken seriously by the mainstream like SETI, because SETI used to be seen as fringe. And hopefully that's what will happen with all of this. Absolutely. And thanks so much, Aleander. I love talking about this. And, you know, it's it's important that we weigh in on um, some of the, you know, things that are being discussed all over the Internet. And To The Stars Academy is. Is there something else you're doing? You've got your website, chasekletsky.com. Of course, we'll link to that. Is there something else you want people to look at? Exploration team called Inca Quest uh, Enterprises. And we're putting boots down in the Amazon and places in South America where humans have never been before. And, you know, hopefully look for some um, new history coming out um, in the next year or two. Ooh, interesting. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks, Aleandro. Thank you so much to Chase Kletsky for joining us on the show. She is awesome and definitely a major asset to the Mutual UFO Network. Um, over there as a director of investigations, any of you who are field investigators, that's your big boss, so you know that. It's been too long since I've had her on the show. I need to have her back more often. And you can find a link to her website, chasekletsky.com, in the show notes, as well as the other website. She couldn't remember the name, but she did uh, let me know after the show. It's Bohick Ruse Explorer Society, and I'll have a, a link to that as well. I also wanted to let you know about something else that's exciting that happened. I have been invited to speak at AlienCon. So a couple months ago, we went, we had a UFO Congress table there, and we sold all of our cool t-shirts and hats and everything. They sold like crazy, but that was in Pasadena a couple months ago. It was packed. So that was a lot of fun. And in fact, they did pull me up for a couple panels. But at this next one coming up in Baltimore in November, uh, that should be huge too. And I'm going to be doing a couple talks there. So I'm going to be talking about Spielberg and E.T. like I did at Devil's Tower. I'm going to talk about E.T.'s and celebrities. And you know I'll fit Tom DeLonge in there with everything that he's done. And then I'll be on some panels and some other stuff. So I'll be active doing lots of stuff. So hopefully we'll see you there. If we do see you, just like those of you who said hi in Pasadena, Hello. It's great to meet you. Uh, Hopefully I'll be able to meet those of you who make it to the Baltimore event. So that should be a lot of fun. It's always good to see my good buddies, uh, Giorgio and um, David Hatcher Childress. They're good friends. And uh, really all the speakers that they have are usually close friends of ours. So it's always fun to meet and hang out. Although we kept so busy with the selling all the shirts and stuff. As usual, I always like to thank Caleb Hanks for the opening and close music. He's such an incredibly talented artist, and so is his brother, Micah. And Micah can be seen, Micah Hanks, who does the Gray Alien Report, he can be seen in that video that I was talking about earlier, at Open Minds uh, Production YouTube. So go check out our YouTube. Uh, you could see that video. It's a really fun video where we're talking about Close Encounters, the movie, in front of Devil's Tower. And keep an eye out on our YouTube for the second part of that video where we're talking about the state of ufology. So lots of fun. Lee Spiegel's in it. Uh, Mark D'Antonio, David Marler, really cool dudes. And we're all talking about uh, what's going on in that lovely setting at the Devil's Tower in Wyoming. And thank you so much to those people, the Olsons and Lori, who put on that incredible event. It was a lot of fun again this year. Love those guys. Hopefully we'll see them at the UFO Congress. Speaking of the UFO Congress, uh, you could go to ufocongress.com to see more about 
what's going on at the new conference, but to see some of those t-shirts and stuff. And of course, if you follow the Congress or Open Minds on social media, you'll also know when we post new videos. So for instance, you can go see Robbie Graham. It's his first presentation in the United States, and that has been posted recently. So you can go watch that um, on the video on demand portal for the UFO Congress and go to the social media, see more about that. And actually we'll have some links below, especially if you are on the listening to this on YouTube. I also want to remind you of one more thing that I'm doing on YouTube. I'm doing every Thursday, I'm doing YouTube live at 6 p.m. Pacific. It's actually 6 p.m. Arizona time, but we're aligned with Pacific right now. That'll change when daylight savings comes around. But uh, those are a lot of fun. So I go over a lot more UFO news and I answer questions from people and tell people about some of the stuff I'm into or doing, such as stuff you can find on my Patreon, which are, are, are items such as some of the space stories that I'm writing and some of the interviews that I'm doing. In fact, I just submitted a story that's going to come up soon about the space X Dragon versus the Boeing Starliner, which is an important story right now because pretty soon one of those craft, right now it's looking like the Dragon, will be the first to take NASA astronauts back to the International Space Station. We haven't had a U.S. vehicle that's been able to do that for many years now, and it's important that we do because our contract with Russia is ending, so we're going to need a lift to this to the ISS. So that's going to be a fun story. You can read more about that on my Den of Geek, but you can see that uh, and my latest stuff on Patreon, and uh, I'll be talking about that on the YouTube show as well. But of course, I want to thank Martin Willis of Podcast UFO for joining me with the news. Again, Caleb Hanks, who does the open and close music. I want to thank Systematics, who does the bumper music. And as usual, I want to thank you, the listener, for listening and and being here once again. Until next time, adios, muchachos.